Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary. We are starting a new sermon series based on Paul's letter to the Galatians called Fruitful Living. Today, we'll be focusing on the first 10 verses of chapter 1. If you'd like to follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Robert Smith. Well, you can have a seat. We want to thank you for being here. And uh, as you're getting settled in, you can take your Bibles and open to the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. And if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, you can take uh, one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you. Uh, In that Bible, you'll find Galatians 1 on uh, page 1154. And as always, if you don't have a Bible with you, we would, or a Bible that you own rather, we'd love it if you would take that home. That's our gift to you today. We want you to read and apply the Word of God. If you're in Parker, you can go ahead and make your way to the back of the auditorium for the last time uh, to get your Bible. Bible back there because you all are celebrating very last weekend in Alumni Hall at Parker High School as you move towards that grand opening of the new building in two weeks. And we are excited. I'm sure you are excited. And I hope you guys spend some time celebrating what God has done in five years there at Parker High School and what God will do in five, 10, 15, 20 years in that permanent facility. We're excited for that. Uh, And speaking of excited, I'm excited to kick off a new study here in Galatians. And if you've been around Calvary, you know that we love preaching books of the Bible. We love preaching the Bible in general, but especially when we have a chance to say, hey, we're going to focus an extended period of time in one book and really getting to know it and spending some time in it. And uh, that's what we get to do. We're kicking off a series in Galatians, and we're going to be in Galatians for a a minute here. We're going to be here for a few months, actually, as we really dive into this book. And And if I'm honest, I love uh, this because I love this section of scripture. When we get to this part of the New Testament specifically, uh, it is just very in your face and instructive and plain English. And it's just, uh, it's so helpful. And I love this part of it. So I love uh, that we're gonna be spending some time in one of Paul's letters here. And so if you don't know about Galatians, give you a little uh, background on that. So it is written by a guy named Paul. He was an apostle. We'll get into his life story a little later and unpack some of that. But uh, uh, he's writing to a group of churches in an area known as Galatia. So not a very uh, creatively named letter here. But, but he had established some of these churches on one of his missionary journeys. Paul was a prolific missionary, went through various areas, starting churches. Uh, as he preached the gospel, he started churches that would continue to preach the gospel in that region. And a lot of what we have in the New Testament is their correspondence of him continuing to teach, uh, and, uh, and we get to kind of be a fly on the wall for some of that and see how it, it soaks into our life as well. Uh, but, but there's some good stuff in Galatians that we get to see. We get to see him really help us unpack the fact that we are saved through faith in Jesus and nothing else. And, and that's going to be a theme throughout the book of Galatians, that, that this fruitful life that we want is found in following and worshiping Jesus. Uh, we're going to see the freedom in Christ that we have and what that means to not live under of rules and the law uh, of the Old Testament, to, but to live in the freedom of Jesus. And also see later on in the book, we'll get to what's known as the fruit of the Spirit, these nine characteristics and character traits that God is committed to teaching each one of us in our life. And that's all in the book of Galatians, so I'm excited about this uh, and excited, and I hope that you spend some time reading Galatians, not just here on the weekends, but, but there are six chapters in the book of Galatians, so I figured this out for you, so here's what we can do. So if you read one chapter a day, starting tomorrow, um, and you'll get through the book of Galatians just in time to come back, same time next week, and hear a message off of something that you read, and you can start it again the next week. And another six chapters, you don't have to do that the whole time, because I'd get a little redundant doing that for, I don't know, uh, 25 weeks or something. But do it for a month or so, and read the book of Galatians. Let that soak in if you're not already reading something specific in God's Word. But uh, we're going to dive in Galatians chapter 1, and I hope you'll follow along with us. Starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and to all the brothers who were with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the, or, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said it before, now I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, as we look at this opening section here in the book of Galatians, there's a push from Paul to really get us to understand the truth of Jesus and the truth of what he refers to as the gospel, this good news of Jesus. And that's because when we understand Jesus, we understand who we are and what our purpose is. And so to help us really understand this and to, to, to catch the imperative, he shows us a few things. He first shows us that we must accurately understand the gospel. And he goes in that kind of that verse uh, five or so, and he says, hey, you're deserting this gospel. You've somehow believed that there's some alternative good news about Jesus. And he's like, there's not. There's only one true understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so Paul's gonna spend the rest of the book helping them understand the significance of the gospel and the, the truth behind it. Uh, and so since we can't read all six chapters right here together, I wanna look at some other places that Paul explains in, in short form what the gospel is. And so Paul has written a lot in the New Testament. We get to uh, kind of be a fly in the wall for some of this. So we'll look at 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. So this is Paul's uh, kind of short-form understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, that he died for us, that he was buried, that he raised and, and appeared to people. And, and this is the, the short form of the gospel, but it's much more than that. Because that's just the, the event surrounding what happened here. To truly understand the gospel, we have to understand how do we relate to this story? This, this huge story of how the God of the universe intersected human history with his son Jesus. How do we connect to that? And so to do that, I wanna share some verses from the book of Romans that Paul wrote that, that explain our role in this. And the first thing we have to understand is that we are all sinners. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. He says we all have this predisposition towards sin, towards us rebelling and going against the plan and desires that God has for us. And we all do it in different ways with different categories and flavors, but all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us that can claim that, that this doesn't apply to us, that this is for someone else. No, this is for each and every one of us. And because of that, there's a penalty due to us. Romans 6, 23 says that the wages of sin is death. So the reason that our world is broken, the reason that there is destruction and death and chaos and disease and tragedy is because sin has tainted the world. But not only in a general sense, also a specific sense, that the, the penalty, the result of us as humanity choosing sin is that we each personally have a sentence of condemnation. In the first sense, we are finite beings. We don't live forever because of this. There is a physical death that, that is a part of this condemnation. But scripture also gives us a much bleaker update in this and that, that we have all earned a sentence of eternal condemnation in hell. Not because God is vengeful, not because God hates us, but because this is the result of our actions in the same way a criminal has a sentence of condemnation. So Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the last half of the verse says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, elsewhere in Romans uh, verse, or chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but God shows his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because God loves us, he sent his son from heaven that we get to celebrate this on, on Christmas, that he came and was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He allowed himself to be falsely condemned to death and nailed to a cross and risen to be crucified there that day. And we remember that on Good Friday, that he died and in that he took the punishment for our sin. 
He took all the condemnation that should have gone to us, all of the wrath, all of the punishment went on him instead of us as he died that day on the cross. And the scripture says, and as Paul explained, he was buried, but then three days later, as we celebrated last week on an Easter, he rose from the grave, showing his power over sin and death and hell, showing the hope that we can have if we live in him, that we have a, the hope of an eternal resurrection as well. See, that is the good news that is there for us, and this results in an invitation. Because this good news, this doesn't get blanketly applied to all of humanity. It, 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 there's an action involved in our part. See, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there's a, there's a commitment that we have to take. We say, okay, this is the good news. This is the gospel. Here is how I interact with this story, but also here is my action step. I have to understand and, and admit that I am a sinner in need of grace, but Jesus came and lived a perfect life, died and rose for me, and I get to surrender and say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, and I wanna follow you. And when we do that, he fills our life with not only the forgiveness of our sin and the, 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 the reconciliation of our relationship, but fills us with joy and purpose and a, and, and a direction for our life because he's with us. And see, this is the gospel that he's saying, guys, why did you so quickly walk away from this? This is the good news that he's writing to this church in Galatia saying, hey, you guys have just deserted this and walked away to something else. And maybe as I'm explaining some of those passages in Romans, you were even tempted to go, yeah, I've heard this before. Okay, I can kind of tune out for a second. Guess what? The people he's writing to in Galatians had heard this too. And yet they were prone to wander away from truly understanding the gospel and how it, it interacted with their life. And the truth is we are all in a place where it is easy to drift from clearly and properly understanding the gospel of Jesus. And I think there's two big picture ways that we can do this. We can either add on to the gospel or we can subtract from it. And both are dangerous. Both distort the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do in our life. And what I've noticed is that churches tend to want to add on to it. They want to add on to it with rules, with control, with uh, legalism. And this is nothing new. It's not just modern American churches that do this. This has been going on for thousands of years because as Jesus was on earth teaching, leading, interacting with people, the, the group that he had the most conflict with was the religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees, and they were the ones in charge of kind of shepherding the, the instructions of, of Scripture. At that point, just the Old Testament and as they looked at it, the 613 laws of the Old Testament didn't seem sufficient to this group of religious leaders, so they were known for adding on to it and having all these extra rules and conditions and things you had to do. And they made following God more about rule following and hoop jumping than about relationship and heart change. And Paul knew this well because he was one of them. Before he's writing this book to Galatians, he was a Pharisee. Well, We'll come back to that in a little bit and see what that means. See, churches today, churches all over America do the same thing. They wanna add on to scripture and they never say that with their words, but they do it with their actions. Because the version of the gospel they portray is more about what God doesn't want you to do than what he does want you to do. So the version that's often portrayed is, is that you can't drink, you can't watch those movies, you can't go to those places, you can't listen to that music, you can't wear those clothes or live that way. And they're always good at portraying all these rules. If you notice, they're also better at portraying those rules to others than they are themselves, but that's a separate issue we'll get to in a few weeks. And in doing so, they communicate a few really dangerous things. They first communicate that that the work of Jesus on the cross somehow wasn't enough. And so we have to do more and, and follow more rules and be extra spiritual to make up for it. Or they somehow communicate that you have to continue working hard for it as if the, the forgiveness wears off somehow. And maybe you've came from that place or maybe you find yourself in that right now as well. And so maybe some of you here today just need to rest from working for your salvation. Maybe you just need to rest in the fact that God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. Maybe you need to rest in the fact that your salvation was completely and perfectly one in what Jesus did on the cross for you. 
And there's nothing more that you have to add on to it. There's nothing more that you have to do for it. You don't have to make up for what your old life was. You simply need to rest in the fact that Jesus perfectly and completely loved and forgave you when you decided to make him your savior. And that the gospel is just that. It's not the, the good news of Jesus and what he did for us and the things that I now do for him. No, it is just Jesus. But we within the church, we're, we're prone to adding on to the gospel and asking others especially to do all this extra stuff. And what I've noticed is that the people outside the church want to take away from the gospel, specifically take away the, the, the specific references to Jesus. And this is nothing new. This has been going on again since Jesus was here. But I've noticed in the last couple of years is, there's this resurgence in talking about God and talking about creator and spirituality, but what's missing is Jesus. And what's under this is, is a false belief in something called universalism. And universalism teaches that all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what your expression of spirituality or God looks like, who you worship to, who you pray to, you all end up in the same place is what universalism teaches. The problem is the Bible doesn't allow us to believe in something like that. Jesus said himself in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The only way to forgiveness, the only way to heaven is through Jesus. This is reinforced by the Apostle Peter in Acts 4.12. He says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So can I just implore you, if you're here and you're thinking that all expressions of spirituality get you to the same place, that is not what Scripture teaches that the only way to this good news is through faith and belief in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And when you come to that place, you are granted forgiveness, you're given purpose, you're given encouragement that God is with you through the Holy Spirit. And God begins to redesign who you are to be more of who you, he created you to be. And the first place that, that he does this is in our identity. Because as we look at this passage, we see that the gospel defines our identity. See, Paul has a, a few words at the beginning of this, this book that I think are important. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how prone we are to like skip over the stuff at the beginning. And I was thinking about uh, not current movies, because I don't want to call them old, because some of you will give me a hard time because they're like, that movie's not old, you're young. I, that's true. Um, but, but as we've shown some of our kids these not current movies, there's all these credits at the beginning of the movie. You start the movie, press play, and there's, here's the director, and here are the actors, and all this stuff. There's several minutes of credits that happen at the beginning of the movie. That doesn't happen anymore because our attention span is too short for that. So we fast forward through it. And I think sometimes in Scripture we just go, oh, well, let's fast forward through that stuff and get to the real stuff. But the opening words of this are really significant because it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Christ Jesus and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That's how he opens Galatians. If we flip over, you wanna hear how he opens Ephesians? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Let's hear how he opens Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Let's hear how he opens Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. 11 times, 11 different books that Paul writes in the New Testament, he opens by saying, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle, I'm a servant, I am a slave to Jesus. This wasn't just a credit that had to be there to open the book, this wasn't just a passing introduction, but this is a peek at what Paul believed about his identity. And the fact that he's saying, hey, I need to establish who I am before you as you read this letter, he's not saying, hey, I'm the guy that started this church, so you need to listen to me. He's not saying, hey, you're in my division, I'm your division manager in the church division of the first century, however that worked, you need to listen to me. He's not saying, hey, I'm Paul, I have this pedigree, this background, this training. He's not saying, hey, here's the credibility I have. But he's saying, hey, who, here is who I am, and it's rooted in Jesus. And that statement is even more significant when you understand the story of Paul. Because I mentioned he was a Pharisee, he was a religious leader. 
And so 15 years before he wrote this book talking about Jesus and saying that he is a servant and apostle of Christ, his life looked very different because he was trained up by some prestigious religious leader in the Jewish sect and he was, he was trained up to be a perfect Pharisee and he worked so hard at it. He was so committed to upholding these laws and commandments and following this tradition of Pharisaicalism. And, and as he did so, he saw Jesus come and Jesus teach and proclaim his, his status as the Messiah and he didn't buy in one bit. In fact, when we read in the book of Acts, Paul was present the first time someone was killed following Jesus' resurrection for not being willing to deny Jesus. They were martyred for their faith and Saul was there. He went by the name Saul at the time. And it says Saul was there and he gave his approval. He's standing going, this is a good idea. We should do more of this. And so he made it his mission to go find, arrest, and persecute Christians to try and end this whole Jesus thing. And so one day, as we see in Acts chapter nine, he comes face to face with Jesus and it changes his life. And, and, and he has an entire life-changing experience where he lets go of all of what he used to live for in terms of his purpose and vocation and, and all of that. And he fully embraces his identity in Jesus. And he goes from trying to find and persecute Christians to going to try to create more of them traveling through tons of different countries and regions, preaching Jesus and establishing churches that would continue to preach Jesus. So again, this statement by Paul opening this letter isn't just a passing comment or some perfunctory statement that has to be there, but it's a peek at who his, how he identified his identity, who he was, what he existed for. The fact that he wasn't there just to make people happy either, but to serve Jesus in everything that he did. And here's the thing, for us, as we think on the topic of identity, we could not understate or overemphasize how important and confusing the topic of identity is in our world today. And there's so many different things out there trying to vie for our attention and commitment to say, latch on to me, or here's how you can identify or modify your identity. And they're all pulling us away from what we were created to be. And they're all things that we've created that we latch on to. And maybe we think that that our identity is rooted in what we do, our vocation or the tasks that we accomplish in life. And so we we latch our life onto the titles of our career or our parenthood or the the accolades of our success. And we, we find our identity there and we wonder why it's never enough and there always has to be the next level for that to satisfy us. Or maybe we attach our identity to the things that we affiliate with, the things that we like and connect to, and so our identity is rooted in our political affiliation or our hobbies or activities or the, the things we enjoy, and we think that our identity is just feeding all of that and connecting to more people who agree with us. Or maybe we think our identity is tied to our past, And so we attach labels to ourself based on our past hurts or traumas or experiences. We don't see the ways God wants to heal and redeem our life. Instead, we carry around labels of shame and belittlement, thinking that that's where identity is. And Paul's saying we have the opportunity to find our identity in Jesus. And so I want to just speak some truth over you today about five things that scripture says about our identity in Christ Jesus. Number one, it says we are made new. First Corinthians five seventeen. if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. You're made new. Second, you are a dearly loved child of God. First John 3, 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. Number three, you are God's creation. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Number four, you belong to a community much bigger than yourself. Ephesians 2.19 says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Number five, you are unique and important to God. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what scripture says about the identity you can have when you say, I am in Christ Jesus. Jesus is my savior. I'm living my life for him. It's so much more than, than what we do or, or what our past is or any of that nonsense. And this is why for, for Paul, it's so important that we understand Jesus because as we understand Jesus, we understand who we are and what our purpose is. But that leads us to our question for today. And the question is, who are you living for? Paul closes with this verse. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, Paul knew that he was living solely for Jesus. It's what allowed him to identify as an apostle. It's what allowed him to call out this teaching, even if it, there was retribution or consequences. It allowed him to go and teach and proclaim these, the good news of Jesus to all these places, even though it meant suffering and, and hardship and punishment as people tried to stop him. Paul understood the imperative of following in the purpose of Jesus and living only for him. As he did that, I think that you see that Paul found freedom and purpose in living out that identity in Christ, and we can too. But there's something that gets in the way of that. And the thing that gets in the way of that is us living for the approval of people. So we have to ask ourselves, are we living for Jesus or living for the approval of people? Because it's so easy to get into that place of people pleasing and trying to make the people around us happy and live for their approval or their accolades or, or whatever it might be. But see, when we do that, it pulls us away from the priorities that we're supposed to be living in. It pulls us away from the, the stuff that we're supposed to be focusing on because instead of focusing on our God-given tasks and, and directives, we start focusing on what people want us to be doing and the things that they are directing and desiring for us to do. And what's interesting is in a few weeks, we'll get to chapter two, and, and Paul actually does a public call out to the apostle Peter for doing this exact thing, for getting too concerned about what this group called the Judaizers thought of him, that it caused him to water down the truth that he knew in Christ. But secondly, it pulls us away, when we're living for the approval of people, it pulls us away from our purpose. Ephesians 2.10, as I said, it tells us that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. We are created to live for God and to live out the purposes that he has created for us. But what happens is that when we start living for the approval of people, when we start living, focusing on what people think of us, start living to try and please and appease them, it not only undermines our ability to do this, but it contradicts our identity. Do you see what Paul says? He says, um, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. See, Paul backs us into a corner here and shows us that, that we have to make a choice. Are we going to live for Jesus or are we going to live for the approval and recognition and accolades of the people around us? They can't coexist our life can't exist for all the things that the world wants to promise us and for the things of Jesus, we have to make a choice. And one of those choices results in life giving freedom and purpose and joy as we live the way that we were created to be. And the other gives us a life that's essentially a house of cards, waiting to crumble as we sell our life and ourself for the approval of people and get disappointment and resentment in exchange. See, as we step out of the Easter season and start studying this new book of the Bible, we see how important it is to truly understand Jesus. Because as we understand Jesus, we understand who we are and what our purpose is. So today, who are you? Are you still attaching your life to the, the, the man-made things around you, the things that you do, the things you affiliate with, the things of your past? Or have you surrendered to Jesus and, and made his purpose and calling in your life your identity? And with that, what is your purpose? Are you living to please people? Are you living trying to, to play whack-a-mole, making everyone around you happy? Or are you living 
to please the one who created you and called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. See, our prayer for you is that as we are here seeking God together, that you would get to know who Jesus is and the life that he has for you. Because as you do that, you'll understand who you truly are in Christ and what his purpose is for you. But the only way we do that is by getting to know Jesus and surrendering our life to him. We hope that you would do that and continue to do that with each passing day. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can be in a place uh, of worshiping you, of, of connecting with you, of spending time with you because it's, that's possible only because of Jesus. Nothing that we have done, nothing we can do can make it possible for us to be forgiven. There's nothing in our life that is intrinsically good that we get to stand before you and see, look what I did for you. But God, you sent your son Jesus to take that punishment to give us forgiveness of sin, to, to hand off his perfect righteousness to us. And God, we just want more of that. We want to draw closer to you and, and attach our life to you so that we can understand our true identity and purpose in you. And nothing uh, diluted by the world around us and the things that are created, the things that weigh us down. God, we just want more of you in our life more of you so that we can worship you, so that we can be thankful and live with gratitude, more of you so that we can understand the, the beautiful life that you have for us when we walk with you. Help us to do this in Jesus' name, amen. So whose approval are you seeking? Paul's guidance is to stop trying to win people's approval, but instead focus on being a servant of Christ. If you're interested in learning more about Calvary, please visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. One of our pastors will reach out to you to answer your questions, get to know you, and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye.